I mean, I get a lot of that. Like people judging me based off just what I look like and like you, like you're just saying, some of us tattoo guys look like this. We're like probably the nicest people the rest of the world would ever meet. We're more inclined to jump out of our car to help you in a crosswalk than most people that don't look like us. Well, I don't know if it's because I'm like making up for my look, but I was just raised that way. So it didn't matter whether I have these, all of this or not, I'm still that way. I'm still gonna jump out of my car to help somebody. How did you get the name Mohawk? I, I got out of prison and I moved to the city of Santa Clarita because uh, my, my mother's house had been shot up due to my previous lifestyle choices in the San Fernando Valley. And my mom moved out to Santa Clarita while I was in prison. And when I came home, I started hanging out with a different crowd and I always had a Mohawk. I always wore a Mohawk. And uh, when I started going bald, I actually tattooed the Mohawk on my head in Mohawk letters like a Mohawk. Do, do you remember your first tattoo? And if so, what was it? I was from a graffiti crew in the San Fernando Valley, and all of us collectively went to this shop in North Hollywood, and we all got our graffiti crew and our graffiti names, and I had them right here. It's still there. No, this, you can kind of see it through the peacock a little bit, but they've been covered up. You know, my earliest tattoos, my first one, I never even used to talk about until like, I, I got out of it, because yeah. it's this ridiculous eyeball on my leg. I yeah. was 20, so I was an idiot. But I kept it because it reminds me of that part of my life when I had yeah. 20 bucks to get a tattoo yeah. and I was a moron and whatever. But having said that, I, I fully get like, if, if you have tattoos that simply remind you of traumas and hard experiences, I think the fact that you can go over them or now more so than previously remove them, I think that's a real gift to be able to help cover or help work against that trauma. Most people are different. Everyone has their own story and their own journey that they have to make decisions for. Thank God I work in an industry with you that we have access to some great guys like this and others that can either alter, change, or cover up some of the stuff that we've made as mistakes as kids. I was one of those kids that was always always impulsive, jumping into it, tattooing stuff on me without thinking about it. Um, I've had so many bad memories removed, covered, um, changed, and altered to fit my new course in life that are necessary for me. You know what I mean? Like I've been through some stuff to where like I needed those memories gone. I went through some stuff that wasn't, it wasn't cool. At the time, like you thought you were doing something for survival and I, and I got these marks on me that are permanent. I had to remove stuff uh, ch and really change a lot of my, a lot of the things I went through in life. About your story, one of the things people talk about who've, who've been in prison, the first day you've got your sentence, boom, you're there and you're like, I'm here for a while and that cell door closes. What was that like for you? When I hit the LA County jail system for the first time, I think I was like 18 by a couple days. LA, California, incarceration life is probably one of the most scary things a grown-up can be in, can be exposed to. You are hit with, upon arrival of the LA County jail system, you're hit with the immediate realization of the hurry up and wait policy, which means you'll be sitting, sleeping on a floor that is covered in piss and sweat from bums, gang members, different races, different cultures. Imagine 50 people asleep in a square place like this, all of us having to use the same toilet use the toilet in front of other grown-ups, which is hard. Going to the restroom as a grown-up, having to take a number two in front of 20 men at the same time, that's a huge, horrifying experience. It's an adjustment. Like it's an adjustment. That's a private moment that I feel every adult needs five minutes personally alone in a room. But to have to do this numerous times a day now in front of 20 men in a tank, to be fed, and people fighting over extra peanut butters and jellies and, and salami, and, and a care bag of crushed up carrots, to the, the forget the, the, that out the way. And then you have to deal with the whole fact of there's gang, racist politics, everything that you don't want to deal with, you're forced into it. You have probably about a five minute window to make a choice where you're gonna go, who you're gonna run with. You're rushed into a dorm setting on the top floor of a county jail, which is 9,500, and then you're approached numerously by different members of these representatives of these gangs and these racist groups. And, like, and I remember, I'll never forget that moment. I mean, I get goosebumps because it was scary. You're in a room full of people that are fucking willing to hurt you at the drop of a dime. And they will too. And a white guy from the San Gabriel Valley, his name was like Warrior. I forget his name, it was something like that. Long hair, looked like a biker, walked up to me and says, hey bro, what race are you? I said, well, I'm white. Well, get, get the fuck over here with us, get over here now. And I mean, I didn't know my ass from a hole in the wall. I didn't know that there was, there's all types of subdivisions within these groups too. Are you a peckerwood, are you a skinhead, are you a gang member? Are you, and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm just white, I'm a white boy. I'm from the valley. So immediately he grabs me and I'm in, the, I'm in the corner. And then you come to the realization in Los Angeles, we are the minority, there's probably six of us and we're being dominated by all these other gang groups and crips and bloods and, and then you have the whites are broken up in between skinheads and woods and white boys and bikers and I'm like, this is a lot. It almost makes you want to throw up. But this is something that when you hit our jail system, you better hurry up and understand this fast because your life depends on it. As my jail 
career expanded. I've done a total of 19 years, three different terms, as I evolved with that group. You know, that, that choice I made at that 18-year-old mark Two stuck minutes. with me. Even though I went home and had come back to jail a few times, that choice stuck from that moment because the thing about the system is it's huge, but it's also small. All of us who go through jail and drugs and gangs, we're all constantly rotated with each other. So as I evolve, yeah, that's where some of those tattoos came from that you think you're doing the right thing, you think you're being involved in a group that's good. Well, those groups and their policies don't apply to the regular world that we live in. And people like me, like, I'm just here for like, I'm, 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 I gotta do what I gotta do, but I don't wanna get it twisted. There's a lot of good things I did learn in jail. When you go to jail, you're gonna learn how to respect the next man. You're gonna learn how to respect, let's just say hypothetically, I was racist. Even if you're racist, you better believe that you're gonna be respectful to black people, Mexicans, Jewish people, everyone. You best believe that you will respect them. You will not. All that shit in your head, you're gonna keep it to yourself, you're gonna shut your mouth. You wanna talk loud, a whole group of people will attack you at one time. So all of those things that you think are paramount, like racism and, and different religious views and different gang cliques, it's weird because people will act like they're about that, but when you're in jail, you don't get to act on that. You're gonna learn how to respect people's opinions, their views. You don't have to agree with it, but you will act accordingly. You're gonna learn how to work with people. You're gonna learn how to function with groups. You're gonna learn how to partake in group events. You're gonna learn how to be part of a team. Because when the team's in trouble, you're in trouble. But when you're doing good, the team's doing good. So there's, there's a lot of really, you're gonna learn how to share. You're gonna learn how to do, deal with private alone time. You're gonna learn how to read books like I did. And you're gonna learn how to get out of that prison by, by bettering yourself. What are some of the most horrifying things you saw in your 19 years in prison? One of the worst things I've ever seen in, in prison, and this is why I tell people, prison is not a, not a culture, it's, a, it's dangerous. And I know a lot of kids think it's like a rite of passage to go to jail and it's, I'm gonna earn my stripes. And you forget though that there's a lot of really bad people that are in prison. There's a lot of people, mind you, I'm, I'm for reform, but I'm also for, there's a lot of people that belong in jail. There's a lot of people that walk amongst us in the world that I worry for my girlfriend's safety, your safety, my mother's safety, children's safety, dog's safety. There, I've bumped into, out there I've out. been around some men that you're just like, Jesus Christ, you deserve that jail cell. And one of the worst things I've ever been around was on a level four prison yard, which is the highest security level in California. Like back to what we said, the group you choose to affiliate yourself with has dire consequences. And I remember this white kid came in and he was identifying as a black crip. And that is a huge no-no in the prison system in California. When you're gonna hit the LA jail system, you are not a crip from South Central and your white ass from Malibu needs to be very aware that this is a lifestyle that you don't understand. So what happened? See, the thing is when you choose to hang out with a group that's not you, this group isn't dumb either. They're also not gonna go to war with a bunch of whites over someone who's confused. Nobody's dumb in the jails. These people, these gang members are extremely, they're like sharks, bro. There's like, it doesn't matter. The race thing doesn't even matter. These individuals are all very smart and they're like sharks in a tank and they're not, they're aware when a guppy comes in and he, does he have the power to stand or not? And they're like, well, check it out. We, we gave him a chance. We're not gonna back him up. And that's the scary thing is, that's why I say it's like chess because these people won't let this person know that they're not gonna back him up. They're gonna pretend. These people have already let them know this dude's not accepted. We're gonna get him if you don't get him. This people say, get him, we won't tell him. It's how scary is that? These, these other races and groups, they communicate with each other. The representatives of each group will have a sit down over a, over a game of pinochle and a cup of coffee and they'll play with your life. They will literally decide the fate. Of, they will negotiate your life, whether you're gonna live or die sometimes over, I'm getting goosebumps. That's how scary these things are. I could cry right now. Because people in prison will play with your life over a cup of Folgers instant coffee and a game of Pinochle, and you have about six minutes to make a decision, does he die or not? This kid's life was forfeited. These two young skinheads ha got, got, the, got the option. They, they were eager. I will never forget this. They were so eager to get this, to volunteer, to kill this kid. It's sick. Mind you, I'm amongst these people. I'm a gang member. I'm also not a, not a sociopath. I know how to blend in, but I'm also aware that, wow, this, this is where it comes in. Some of these people are sick. These kids volunteered for it. They made weapons. We go to yard, they have the weapons hidden. They get the, they get the weapons and this kid goes and they jumped on him like two spider monkeys and they hit him so many times with these weapons that the prison guard in the tower was so, I mean, a normal human being seeing an act of violence like this is gonna be shocked. And this woman who's trained, this is her job for the Department of Corrections. Immediately in our, in our institution, when you see inmates fighting, they're supposed to shoot. They have the legal right to shoot you and kill you if you're fighting in a stabbing position. This woman was so horrified at what she saw that she was, I remember looking up and seeing her in the tower with the gun just frozen. Nobody's prepared to see something like this. They stabbed this kid so many times in his head. 
was hanging and then eventually the head fell off and this kid, there was so much blood. There's a lot of blood that comes out of the human body. And these kids were playing, they were slipping in the blood. It was like something you'd see in a movie. The kid's head rolls, one of the dudes kicks his head and the, the guys are so exhausted. They stabbed this kid so long that they were tired. They literally, I will, this is the worst part of it. Not that they killed him. The worst part is that they sat down on the ground, they threw their knives and they both said, hey, we did our job, come get us, we're ready to go to jail. These kids were smiling. They were sitting covered in blood, in a pool of blood, they were smiling. Because they know that to them, they're never going home anyway. So they just made their name. They just made themselves in history. And I'm sitting there, I was pretty not too far from the event. It was just sick, but it was shocking. And that's how serious it can get in prison. I had such PTSD, I tried, after that stuff happened, there was a few other incidents like that that I saw that I wasn't okay with. And uh, I developed a heroin habit pretty strong in prison. And I had to fight that battle when I came home from prison. I got back on crystal meth to get off the heroin. And then I played piggyback on the heroin, the meth, the heroin, the meth. Meth kicked my ass worse than any prison fight I've ever been in. That methamphetamine brought me to my lowest place ever. Heroin was easier than crystal meth for me. And my last day, I remember I did about 17 shots of crystal meth and heroin, and I wasn't getting high. And I remember I had been praying to God and Odin both, like, please, I'm done. I don't know how to stop. I need help for about two weeks. And finally the day came. I wasn't smart enough to realize my prayers had been answered. And I remember hitting my door at my mom's house. I'm like, mom, I'm ready. Please come get me. Dude, my mom is my best fucking friend. She's my best friend ever. She's the, she's been through hell and back and she has stood by me past things. I, I still wonder, why are you still standing there? And my mom ran up the stairs, little old lady. And she, she's like, are you ready? I'm like, yeah, I'm ready. What do you want me to do? I don't care. I'm just, I'm sweaty. I'm covered in filth. So once a week, she would bring me a bag of sullen clothing because she knew how much I loved that. And so every week I'd make it to Friday, to Friday. And then at nine months, my mom was like, okay, you got nine, bring me a year sober, but do it on your own now. No more clothes, you get your own clothes. <laughs> and I did it. And I, and I, when I bumped into Uncle Jeremy at Music a few years ago, I walked up to Uncle Jeremy and I loved him. And I had the badge, a little tiny, ugly. I've had it redone. And I remember walking up and be like, hey, Jeremy. And then I, I pulled him aside. He, he was happy, he shook my hand, took a picture of me. And then I told him my story. And he looked at me and goes, are you fucking kidding me? I'm like, I wouldn't have been able to get sober. I mean, obviously I made the choice myself, but that little carrot that was dangled in front of me every Friday was sullen clothing. I had to go through that ugliness because people always ask me, well, would you change it if you could? I'm like, nah, I couldn't because if I changed that, I wouldn't be the dude who's right here right now. And I wouldn't probably have met Uncle Jeremy. If I changed that, I wouldn't have gone through what I went through to remove dumb tattoos, to change my life, to change my thinking, to, to change my behavior. I had to change, all that had to go. You, you had a saying, or you, 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 I saw you repeat a quote, which has always been one of my favorite quotes that I kind of keep close to myself, which is, uh, history is, is written by the victors, or history is written by the yeah. winners. And I saw you said that in an interview, and I, and I perked up, because I'm like, I, I always remind myself and others about that, yeah. is, you know, if you want to not bitch about the outcome later, yeah. if you want yeah. to not sit there and say, oh, this could have happened, that should have happened, don't allow that to happen, you know, write your own outcome. Yeah. You know, history is written by the victors. Take control of what yeah. you can. And I think you're a great example of that. I hope so, yeah. I mean, I hope so. I've done my best to try and be a good example of that. But you're right, history is, is told by the winners.